Hello and welcome. You are in Entrepreneur Q&A or Startup Question and Answers, whatever you like to call it. I'm Roger Pierce, your host, and in just a second I'll introduce my co-host, Lily Ma. We're here today to answer your questions about starting and growing a small business. Many of you have submitted your questions through Evan Carmichael's channels, either on his YouTube channel or perhaps through his website. And we're going to do our best every week in the time allowed to answer a few of those questions. And hopefully you'll pick up some great tips and advice along the way. So who am I? And why am I answering questions about small business? I am a small business owner. I've had 14 small businesses, maybe a few more. I don't want to count. I've all been in the area of marketing, sales, and entrepreneurship. In fact, my last few companies have all been in the business of helping. My current company is called Pierce Content Marketing, and we produce small business content to help big brands and banks to connect with small business owners. I'm also co-author of a book, given my fair share of workshops and seminars around the world on small business, and I've trained, I'd say, thousands of small business owners in those workshops and seminars. So I really love small business. I really love entrepreneurship, and I'm excited to be here with you. My co-host is Lily Ma, and she is a speaker, entrepreneur, and coach. Please introduce yourself, Lily. Hello, everyone. It's so nice to see everybody. It's, uh, I always like to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, because we are reaching everyone globally as well, which we're going to see in the questions. So who am I? I like, I like the way uh, Roger, Roger um, explained it. He's like, who am I and why am I answering these questions about startups and entrepreneurship? So I'm going to answer the question for myself as well. Uh, like Roger mentioned, I am a coach. So what I do is I help people with their businesses, whether it's a startup or if it's a growing business, and I invest all my energy and time in helping people make their lives better. And one of the things that are important to people are their businesses. So that's why we're here, and that's how we got together in the first place. Well done. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Lily. And I know you've managed to get some very interesting questions lined up for us today. Yes, today I'm gonna take more of a role of a student because I am so interested in finding out what your answers are gonna be to these questions because they're really interesting ones today. I mean, they're always interesting, but today, especially interesting. So the first question comes from Mike. He's asking, are there too many people trying to become entrepreneurs right now? Will the field become too crowded? Will it take away opportunities and limit success? Very good question, Mike. Thank you for setting that in. A very interesting question. It makes me stop and think of, think about the, the marketplace and are we going to get saturated with entrepreneurs out there? I can understand why you're concerned. It seems like entrepreneurship and small business and startups and founders are everywhere. You see it on TV with shows like Dragon's Den, Shark's Tank, movies like The Social Network, one of my favorite shows is Silicon Valley. You're seeing it in books. Um, the media is always talking about the latest billion dollar deal. So I can understand your concern about, hey, are we at the threshold of too many entrepreneurs? But I think to calm your concerns, I would say to you that there is no limit to the number of entrepreneurs the world can handle. In fact, one of my favorite expressions is the world needs more entrepreneurs, and hopefully you're on your way to becoming one. In Canada, we're actually on a bit of a down, downward trend in terms of the number of startups. It used to be about 150,000 new businesses enter the market every year. Now we're down to about half of that, or 75,000 or so. In the States, it's pretty constant, about 500,000 small businesses start up every year. Now that still only puts us at about 20% of the population, the working population, being self-employed. So about one in five in America are working for themselves. So lots more room to grow, lots more people can still become entrepreneurs. If I read into your question a little bit more, Mike, you know, you're concerned about, hey, are we gonna run out of good ideas? Are all the great ideas taken? 
And a couple words to give you comfort. You know, a good idea is nothing without execution. So while there might be a lot of great ideas out there, not enough people are following through and taking action on them. So yeah, make sure you marry it with execution because that's what's going to make, make it a success. I'd also say to you that the competition is fiercest in the world of e-commerce applications. We're seeing a lot of companies start up apps, software as a service, Instagram, Facebook, all these platforms popping up. It seems like everyone's making a billion dollars in a hurry. So, you know, it's going to be a challenge if you choose to compete in that space to perhaps find your niche. But if you do a little digging and you keep your eyes and ears open, you should come up with something that's very unique. And bottom line, Mike, I would say to you, the more entrepreneurs, the better, because it draws more attention to our cause, if you want to call it that. The more entrepreneurs we have, the more attention we get from banks and lenders and investors and government and media, and that just helps all of us to succeed in whatever it is we choose to do in business. Mm -hmm. Lily, what are your thoughts? I love it. I love it the part that you said that ideas are nothing without execution. And I think that is so true. Uh, I'm a recently minted entrepreneur, so I haven't been in the business as long as you have. And I have seen there's been a rise of interest. I would say a rise in interest in entrepreneurship. And uh, it again, it's popularized by different TV shows. It's uh, popularized by all of these really young millennials going out there and doing these incredible things. Like Mark Zuckerberg would be, a perfect example of that but it all comes down to execution and being in it for the long haul uh, when I I didn't I didn't ever think I was gonna be an entrepreneur uh, I became an entrepreneur because there I felt like there was a need for it like I needed to be an entrepreneur because I wanted to shape this path uh, where I can move the entire human race forward in a positive way which is why my business was born, which is why I do coaching, which is why I do speaking. But I know I'm in it for the long haul and there have been really difficult times during my startup as well. So execution's always key. I have a, not, I have a follow up question to that, Roger, that I wanna ask you. I've been meaning to ask you actually. You have been in entrepreneurship for a long time now, but way before it was like the in thing to do. Like how, how have you been able to last this long? I think I sort of asked you that question last week, but I want to touch upon it even more because of this question that's coming from Mike. How have I lasted this long? I'm just too mm -hmm. stubborn to do anything else. And there comes a point too when you've worked for yourself for so long that no one else will hire you. Not that I want a job anyway, but mm -hmm. I'm ruined for employment. No one will ever, no one will ever touch me because they know I just go back to running a business. <laughs> so you kind of have to make it work. That's kind of the point of no return. Yeah. But I just get excited about new ideas, and I've been a serial entrepreneur. I guess that's the definition, as opposed to, hey, look, someone who starts up a, a mom and pop shop and just keeps it going for decades. I admire that type of entrepreneur as well too. They've got stick to itiveness. I get my kicks from starting and launching new companies. A couple of them I've sold, a couple of them I've gotten out of, a couple I've shut down because they were unsuccessful and they lost money. But at this moment, I technically have three companies going and I'm still incubating a couple of projects on the side. So I guess that's what gets me through all those years. It's just I get excited about a new idea in my field and I have to do it. Nice. And what is the process between because we talked about ideas and execution. What is your process from idea to execution stage? Idea to execution stage is a very fun period of time because you're trying to figure out, A, if this thing is gonna work, and B, how do I make it work, and what do I see, what do I need to make it work? So that's when you really should be a sponge and soaking up all kinds of ideas to make take your idea to fruition, you know. Uh, what is the best course of action for my business? How do I get the right people involved? What kind of money will there be? That's when you should go and attend things like trade shows, read lots of articles online, buy lots of copies of Entrepreneur, read all of Evan Carmichael's books, all those things because you're looking for ways to execute on your idea. Nice. Beautiful. All right. So on to the next question. 
this okay so it comes from tom and he says i'm looking for a tech co-founder for my startup where do i find a trustworthy person good question so you're an entrepreneur i'm not quite sure if the business is already going or it's in the ideation stage it doesn't really matter a couple of comments for you tom my first question is why do you need a partner i want you to chew, think about that very carefully why do you need a partner which would be a shareholder in your company, maybe an equal shareholder in your company, instead of hiring someone who has the skills you need or outsourcing to a supplier who has the skills you need. So there are, in business, there's always more than one way to go about anything. And I'm a big fan of looking at all the options and coming up with narrowing it down to the best one for you. So you might say, hmm, Maybe I need to bring in someone as an employee as opposed to giving away half of my company to get these skills, you see? Because a partner should really be almost someone who, who's, who's irreplaceable or, or, or so instrumental to the company that they cannot, they cannot be outsourced. They bring so much skill and talent and resource or maybe money to the company that you need them to have ownership. And there's no other way around it. If you think, no, maybe I don't, they don't have all those attributes, then I would consider option B, outsourcing, option C, hiring that person as an employee. If you decide to go ahead and get a partner, develop a profile, because now you're gonna be shopping for someone, much like you would uh, an employee profile. If you're looking to bring in a new employee, you wanna develop a nice, nice description of that person. So write a little short summary of your wish list, who you would like to bring on board, and then start to go external. Some of the groups I'd recommend checking out, and definitely do a Google search online to find entrepreneurship organizations in your area. But uh, depending on where you live, Young Entrepreneurs Association, Young Entrepreneurs Council, The Entrepreneurs Organization, which is huge, and their website is www.eonenetwork.org, eonenetwork.org, or any local meetup groups is where you might find your soulmate in terms of a founder. Last bit of advice though, Tom, try before you buy. Let's say you find the perfect potential entrepreneur partner or co-founder. Is there a way the two of you can work together on a trial basis before you start issuing shares or setting up the corporate papers? or come on board for a three month or a six month trial period to make sure you get along well, you work well together, and this person has all the skills you are led to believe that they have. It's like dating before you get married because trust me, as a guy who's been through several partnerships, you wanna know who you're getting in business with before you sign any documents. Mm -hmm. What about you, Lily? I think you summed it up perfectly. I, I, I am I think it, it is, inc I want to underscore certain parts, like try before you buy. That is the most important thing for me uh, when it comes to giving people suggestions and advice when it comes to finding the right partner. Because you don't really know. Maybe on paper they seem great, but have a have a face to face meeting with them. See how it works. Do a small project together. See if your values actually line up. Talk to them about your values. I've had situations where I had startup, startup entrepreneurs, they said, well, I'm afraid to talk about my values with my partner. I was like, well, there's a problem right there. <laughs> there's a huge problem right there. This person is like, you're gonna be married to this person. You're gonna spend as much time with them as you would with your own partner at home. So if you're afraid to talk to them about their values, that's not a good sign. So just wanna underscore it, not add it to it, add too much to it, so that was good. That's great, Roger. Okay, question number three. Uh, it comes from Ashish. Ashish is a teenager from India. And Ashish writes, I am passionate, I'm passionate and full of energy. What is one piece of advice that an 18-year-old aspiring entrepreneur needs to hear? Great question. One piece of advice. Uh, I would say get a mentor. Mm. Ashish, because a mentor is going to jumpstart your success and hopefully help you avoid too many startup troubles. Mentor can also help you 
choose right business to get into because maybe they've got some ideas on where an industry is heading uh, and a mentor just really accelerates all things entrepreneurship if you can find the right one like we just talked about shopping for a partner shopping for a mentor write up a little wish list a job description if you would for the perfect mentor for you and then start to tap into your personal and professional network or maybe through teachers or through your family and the right net, right mentor relationship for you mm -hmm. lily you've got lots of experience with us too yeah mentorship is very uh important uh i do have a mentor myself it's um evan and how the relationship developed with us was was not so much me going up to him and saying, oh, I want to start a business, can, I, can you mentor me? It was more of an organic relationship that begun. And the reason why he chose to mentor me and not someone else is because he saw that how hard I would work. And he saw that anything that he threw at me, I would deliver 200%. And I will always deliver value. So I think for Ashish, for you, before you actually ask someone to be a mentor, show them that you can learn very fast and you could deliver tons of value and you're willing to work hard at it. Because the last thing, Roger, maybe you could weigh in on this too. The last thing a mentor wants to do is to think, oh, I gotta train this person. Because they're busy people. There's a reason why you chose them to be a mentor. You wanna show them that you could, del you could give them something that is of value and also you'll be a really quick learner and you could work really hard. You're right. There's a contract you can download off the internet. There's lots of them out there. A mentee mentor contract that basically commits both parties to expectations. So it's not just about, you know, hey, miss, Mr. or Mrs. Mentor, when are you available? It's you're going to meet with me three times a month, or we're going to have a phone call, or we're going to have a FaceTime, or we're going to have a Skype. You're okay with me sending you questions. And it also defines the reasons for backing out of the relationship. So if the mentee is not fulfilling their end of the deal, the mentor is the right to pull the plug. Like any good relationship, it's great to define it at the beginning so both parties are clear. Nice. I love it. Okay. One last question, Roger, and it comes from me. Ah. Uh -oh. My question for you. Can you train creativity? And is it important to be creative in business? Can you train creativity? Well, it's important to be creative in business. Mm -hmm. Business is all about problem solving. Mm -hmm. and being able to come up with solutions from different angles. I guess that's what I like most about business is, you know, you've got to think outside the box. You've got to look at an issue or an opportunity from all sides and see how you can best approach it. So that is creativity, right? Mm -hmm. um, for me, I practice creativity the most when I'm selling and I'm dealing with big companies and the sales cycle is long, three months, six months or longer. And so every interaction, I'd like to think, how can I advance the selling process? How can I get that person to get back to me or encourage them to want to work with us? Or how can I get them to say yes to the proposal without just being a typical salesperson following up and trying to mm -hmm. sell them? So a little bit of creativity in the selling process and each of the steps within the selling process is how I typically apply creativity. Starting up a business, of course, is a very creative process because you're usually trying to do it without too much money and in a very short period of time. So lots of creativity required there. To answer your question, how can creativity be trained? I would say yes, I don't see why not. Um, how would you foster creativity? You could, ex you just gotta expose your mind. You've gotta open up your, your prejudices to a new way of thinking. Reading books, certainly travel, will get your creative juices going because you're gonna be exposed to so many new ways of doing things in different parts of the world, listening to other business, own, business owners, excellent way to boost your creativity and get your creative muscles working, and reading the, the stories of successful business owners in the world and superheroes, um, so you get an idea of what they did to succeed and how they applied creativity and their businesses to get to where they wanted to be. 
Evan's got a new book coming out, Top 10 Rules for Success, that does just that. He brings up the, the best snippets from the world's most iconic entrepreneurs and serves them up to the reader. And uh, you'll find a lot of creative approaches that the world's biggest names have taken to get themselves to where they are. So I do believe creativity can be trained. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. It actually just, uh, it confirmed what I already believe. So I, I love that the way you answered it. Uh, the reason why it's such an important question for me, because uh, when I was younger, I shunned out creativity completely out of my life uh, because I was a very driven young woman. And I felt like creativity was something you did for fun. It was more of a hobby. I was into math. I was into statistics. I was into a, a market analysis. So I kind of like took that away and it was like my perception of what creativity was. So I had to do a lot of um, retraining of myself and practicing my creativity to become creative again because it is so important in running your own business. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, Lily, because I was going to ask you, can you give us a quick update on your own business journey? My own business journey. So where am I at? Uh, so for Roger and for the people watching, uh, I'm a service-based business. So I do a lot of coaching as well as uh, I do speaking as well. And they're both me, basically me and my laptop. And that's how I run my business. So recently, I have seen a big uptake in my business. I, I have a lot more uh, ongoing clients now. Before, it was kind of uh, one-off. Or I provided a lot of free services in the beginning. And I delivered a lot of value. And I made sure that I gave them the best experience possible. But in the beginning, I just wasn't that good, right? Even though I read books, even though I took courses, even uh, I was very educated in the field I was in, I just didn't have enough practical knowledge. And then recently, so I'll just to give you some numbers, I did 100 free coaching sessions. Wow. 100 free coaching sessions. And after the 50th one is when I started to see a lot of people come back. They're like, hey, how, how much are you going to charge for me to uh, be your ongoing client and that's when I knew it was a perfect time for me to start charging and then now I have now I have ongoing clients yeah and then next up I'm looking for my 10th client once I get my 10th client I'm gonna hire an assistant so I could grow my business a little bit more and scale it well I guess lunch is on you then you're doing very well <laughs> I don't think so <laughs> so that's where I'm at Roger that's great. Keep it, keep going. Sounds like you're, you're you're making great progress, and I love the idea. You're gonna free up your time to do the most important things by hiring some help, so you can delegate. Yes, I'm not that far away. So uh, yeah, hopefully by next time we speak, I would get there already. Awesome. Well, mm -hmm. thank you so much. Yeah. Well, I think that's it for me. Anything else for you, Lily? No, that's it. Thank you so much. Well, everyone who's watching, thank you so much for joining us today. Don't forget. Same time next week, we'll be back to answer more entrepreneurship questions with Roger Pierce and Lily Ma. Thanks for joining Thank you so much, guys. Bye-bye.